We're in 1 Peter chapter 2, and uh, if you're brand new to this, this lesson will be on YouTube long about 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon, and if you miss any of the lessons and go away, um, this is about, num we're up to like number 10 already, and so you can catch anything that you've missed, and that you can, you, you won't see me, but you'll see this screen and you can advance it, take notes, uh, pause it, you do all sorts of cool things. I want to review with you a little bit. Um, usually I advance the pictures uh, for you, but um, we're just going to start where we started last week in chapter 2 because it'll be very quick. Chapter 1 was Simon says we are called to salvation and we should rejoice in our salvation. We as God's people need to be people of rejoicing, thankful, praising God for what he's done for us. Chapters 2 and 3, Simon says that we're called to submission. And I put in, in exclamation marks that we are to live. You have, we don't generally do and like to deal with submission. In a lot of ways, we're like the, the people in the book of Judges. They did right in their own eyes, and they just, hey, leave me alone. I want to do what I want to do. And the American culture today is truly the me culture. Make me happy. Take care of me. Give me. And the Lord teaches us just the opposite. It's not about what we get, it's what we give. It's not about me, it's about others and about, and about God. And, and God has put, and the Lord has put up in some, some standards and given us principles in the Word of God to live by how we can really live and be fulfilled and be happy. And that's what this is talking about. That's what these chapters are on. Also, I was talking with Carol this week, and she says, you know, Paul got really elaborate in his stuff. And, but Peter wrote, bam, 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 bam. He just got to the point and moved on. Now, I, don't, I haven't said this to you, but I'm going to let you know a little secret. If you read all of Paul's writings, you're going to run across the same stuff in First and Second Peter. But First and Second Peter is the, how do I want to call it, the caps, the the capsule, the small, it's like the commentary, redu it's, it's Paul reduced into eight chapters. Now Paul elaborate on stuff and some things Peter doesn't hit here. But when we talk about submission, we talk about not my will, Lord, but your will. And when we, when we live and obey the commandments of God and are, have a servant's heart and not the one that wants to be the leader and the boss, God blesses us, and we pick up these principles in chapters 2 and 3. So we live, we already looked at the first one last week. Crave the word, not the world. And the verse that we read, it talked about this newborn babe's desire, have a craving, have a passion for the sincere milk, the, the honest, the pure milk of the Word of God. Get excited, and chapter 2 deals with the Bible, and it deals it in different ways. In, in the first three verses, it deals with the Bible and tells us, treat it as milk, something desirous, something exciting, something wonderful to read. It is milk. God's Word is milk. Now, before we go to the next one, I need to, to just share with you one thing. All, if, if all of us in here are on, a, are, on, are on a path, if you are born again and know Jesus Christ as a Savior, the good news is we're all on the same path. We're all traveling the same road together. Where we are, if I had to diagram it, where are we as Christians? Or where are we with the Bible? What is the Word of God to us? We are all in, different, in a different realm while we're on the same path. We're in a different progression of what do we know about the Bible? There'd be some of you in here that would say, well, I'll never get to know as much as you know. Well, that's not right for you to do that to start with. And I don't know so much that that's true. I guarantee you, everyone in here knows something about the Bible that I do not know. And you could teach me. You would know at least one thing. Now, I'm not going to take the time and pass a microphone and you're going to say, hey, Baker, bet you didn't know this. And... Um, and this and this, but I, I would know things that you don't. And as, as your teacher, I have the privilege of going on a treasure hunt every week. 
I go digging and go looking and, and I have the blessing of finding cool stuff. Now, if you teach, you understand that or have taught, you understand the blessings and the richness that, that just magnifies your life when you get into God's word. But, there, but see, you know things that I don't know and I know things that you don't. I've been saved longer than some of you, but that doesn't mean that I know more scripture than you do. See, God looks at us as just as an individual, not a comparison. We're not a statistic. And so I would encourage you to read your Bible. If you're brand new at this, I, I wouldn't say jump in and just start reading the Bible and read it all through. I would say go read the book of John first and get to know who Jesus is. And then read the, then read the book that pastor's just finishing up, 1 John, and read it what John says about Jesus and who he is. What a, a, a guy like you and us, a person. And those are very basic. Those are, those are good, easy books to read. John will show you, and I steer you to John because John portrays Jesus as, as the Son of God. And we need, to, we need to read Jesus in this culture and in this life that he is God. He's just not a cuss word. He's not just something that's out there in print somewhere in, in novels. So as, as God's people, I just challenge you, wherever you are in your Christian life, get yourself in the Word of God and make it count. Do something right. Take notes in the margin of your Bible when you find something cool, or a sheet of paper. And find, do word studies, do book studies, do, sub, do subject studies. How do, I, how do I handle when I do the issue, an issue series with you? How, what, did I, what did I do when I did the series? I've done it three times, Islam, um, Amer uh, Israel, Islam, and America. And I tried to vary it and upgrade it each time. But what do you, what do, you do when you teach something like that? Now I don't go read the, the Koran. I don't. I don't read the Koran. I get into the Word of God and find out Islam and the, and, the, and the descendants from the word of God and where they came out of. And because of how the Israelites and God said to deal with them, gee, I have some advice for our new president-elect. And I got the same advice for the one going away and, the whoever pre and whoever comes after Trump. I have some advice. Find out what God said on how to deal with Edom and Moab. Find out how he said to handle them and what, they, and what they're like. I know exactly how they're like in their hearts and what drives them. You say, man, why aren't you president? I was wondering about that. And uh, so, no, kidding. Um, I, I would like it for one day with a box of pens. I'll just say that, okay? i just say that. The problem is that's not the way to do it. That's a dictator. It is. Man or a woman with a box of pens and just writing, that's dictatorship. We, we are a republic that has a democracy, and that involves all of us. Understand, every time I would write something, I affect 300 plus million people immediately. And I don't know, I don't have the foresight to see the ramifications of how that all, all goes out. See, I can come in here and I can throw a bucket, a bucket of water up in the air, but I can't decide, I don't, after that, I'm not in control, am I? I don't know where that's all going to go. So, yes, I'd like to be president a little, but no, not a lot. So, guess what? I'm, I'm happy to be in here. So, I'll just sort of be president of the class or something or, or whatever. And I, yeah, I'm, I just love it to no end. So do you understand? Get into the Word of God and don't, just don't shut it aside. Well, you say, well, I, I'm, a, I, I'm part of the program that I read the Bible through in a year and I'm motivated and so I'm already done. So I don't read it anymore. Well, get a start, go, get a start on it again and go through the New Testament again. It's, the Bible not, should not be a task. The Bible should be loved. Okay, we got to move on. Okay, here's, here's the new one. Simon says, accept the living stone, don't reject it. Okay, we looked about milk, now we're going to look about stones and rocks. Well, that's quite different. One is liquid, isn't it? Unless you freeze it or boil it. But rocks are solid. In fact, rocks are pretty solid. 
I could handle, I, I've spilt milk on me, but I don't want to dump a barrel of rocks on me. So rocks have some solidity, solidity to it and some foundation. Keep in mind, Jesus is the Word of God. And when we get into the Bible, we, re are, we are reading the living Word of God. We are learning about the living Christ and His workings. And so some, to some people, Jesus needs to be milk. And I like milk. And I've been saved 50-some years. But I still love milk. I, I'll, I'll confess to you, I love bowls of cereal. Do any of you like bowls of cereal? I love cereal. But I'm going to tell you something real quick. I do not have cereal for breakfast. I don't want, I don't want it. I drink milk and I basically have a, a piece of toast in the morning. And I'm very happy to do that. But I have a glass of milk. I like milk. Chocolate milk is good too. And lunch, eh, I, I might have milk. I don't know. But if I tell you a secret, will you, will you promise to tell it? Yeah, I know you would. Okay. I love, I have since I was, I, as far as back as I can remember, after supper, I, my, that would be my snack watching TV in the evening. And nobody ever told me when you get married and leave home or go to college or you get into high school, you got to give that stuff up. And I just, I just have a bowl of cereal in the evening time. That's my snack. And I love snacks. And, uh, I think that's just so cool. Now, I know that's turned you off. and it, no, no, it hasn't. Is there anybody else that you like? <laughs> Confession time. Anybody have bowls of cereal other than breakfast? Other than that? I have a breakfast tonight. Amen. Praise God. Brother? Put ice cream on it. We're, I'll see you tonight. Okay? <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have some good stuff. So I like milk. We don't outgrow milk. However, we need the solidity of the rock of Jesus Christ in our life too. We need the constant, we need the power of that. On a second. I need to finish these two. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Okay, you say, oh, that's confusing. That's a mouthful. That's a ton of stuff. Let's cut it. Let's, let's cut right to the verses themselves because this is how we can sort it out very quickly. To whom coming, verse 4, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Who's, be, who's, who's being talked about here? Is this saved Israel? You, me, who's this? I'm hearing murmuring. Who is it? It is Christ. It is Jesus talking about here. To whom coming? To Jesus coming. And as he came, he came in many different ways, but he also came as a living stone. Remember way back in chapter 1 early, we looked at all the times that the word living came up in First and Second Peter? This is one of them. He's a living stone. We looked at a living hope. We looked at some other things that you have that list of. But in this case, it talks about to whom Jesus come, came as a living stone. But when he came in the flesh, what does the early scriptures and the gospel say? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Disallowed, in, he was disallowed indeed of men. He came unto his own, and he was disallowed. What they did is they rejected him. The word disallowed means they rejected him after examination. Okay, now get this. Israel, in truth, they were the, 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 the leadership and the culture of Israel, when Jesus walked publicly in his ministry for those three years, they were examining him. They were examining him everything that he did. They, they watch, you healed on the Sabbath. Well, who says this? This is, coin has Caesar's image on it. What do, you, who, what do you say about that? Jesus says, give to Caesar what's his, but give to God's what's his. They were constantly examining. They were asking trick questions. Some were uh, extremely honest questions. Nicodemus, a great religious leader. John 3, on the rooftop. The, the woman that Jesus met in John 4, the Samaritan woman at the well, she asked some she tried to divert some things to make herself look better and put herself in a better spiritual position, but she came to Christ honestly. 
and asked honest questions to him. She was examining. The disciples were watching. And so they watched and they examined. And I got news for you. Most of them, the leadership, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, the chief priests, the high priests, the people in charge, they knew who he was. But because of power and position and just outright pride, they said, we will not have this man reign over us. And they rejected Jesus Christ. That's what this verse is. It's just a reminder that he came to his own and his own received him not. Indeed, but understand this, it didn't change the fact that Christ was not chosen of God and was not precious to God himself, his only son. This is my only begotten son. Hear ye him. Jesus was precious. Okay, are we good on that? That should be pretty well understood. It's about Jesus and his rejection the first time that he came. Verse 5, you also, now he turns to saved Israel. Oh, I was going to ask you that as a question. Rat. Oh. Okay, it, it's saved Israel and it's also us, Christians, people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he said, okay, you Christians, you also are like Jesus. If you know, you know Jesus, you're also living stones. And you are built a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Okay, get this. That's a mouthful. But First and Peter are written to primarily saved Jews. Their culture was, was based and comes out of where? And their belief system and their faith and the things that they were taught, their religion and things like that. Where would that all come from? Common. Go back to the Old Testament. It's all, you got 39 books there all about it. It was the law. It was traditions. They were brought up in that and steeped in that and heavy in that. And Peter, writing to them, brings up some very interesting things. What, what's one of them looks like there? It starts with an H and the second word P. He brings up the priesthood, doesn't he? Every Jew understood the priesthood and the priests and the system, the religious system that went on. What, what, a, what a shattering thought for Peter to write to them that, under the inspiration of the Lord and say, now, get this. As a child of God, God is establishing and God is building through your life and in your life a priesthood as the priest of the Old Testament. But the chief priest is Jesus. And in building in you, you are building the kingdom of God and building other people. And you are glorifying and bringing about the fruition of Jesus Christ and his life and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what's being taught here. And the word spiritual sacrifices, when I read that, when I was read through this initially, I read that, I glossed right through that. And I said, I don't want to deal with that. I don't know what that is. Did you? You say, you're kidding. No, there's sometimes I don't want to look that up. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. And so that got glossed over. And then I got, I, then I looked at the whole verse and I said, there aren't anything, there's nothing in there that hasn't been taught or will be taught down the road as far as words in the Greek. I said, okay, I give up. I'll go do that. And so I spent time and I looked that up and I found out, here's really what I thought it was. When it talked about it's God's people that we offer up spiritual sacrifices, I thought that's, I really said, I really think I can get away telling the class from Romans that we present our bodies a what? A living sacrifice. And that's not what that is. So you wouldn't believe me today if I told you this is, the, this is, your, this is our, our bodies that we give our lives, our physical lives to the cause of Christ. And you should not believe that today. That's not what it's talking about here. So I'm not going to tell that to you. Yes, sir. Wayne? Well, they were taught sacrifices, correct. But what's being, what Peter once again is bringing out, he's talking about a priesthood, and, they, and the Jews all knew, understood the sacrifices. But once again, what a concept to share with them that all of a sudden, that you are, your, your body is the sacrifice, Paul said. And Peter says to you, you, you the sacrifices that God wants no, are no longer animals. 
God wants the sacrifices of your life, and he wants the spiritual sacrifices, which are thanksgiving and praise. What a lead into this week. Wow. I, and I didn't time it that way. And so our life should be a life of praising God and thanking God and walking this life. And, and when we get up in the morning, we say, Lord, thank you for a new day. Lord, thank you for this. We need to praise God. We, get, we see something happen and we pray or we see an answer to prayer. We should be people of praise and people of thanksgiving. We're building a priesthood. The priest, the priest was called, called of God, chosen of God. But who was chosen of God here? Jesus was chosen of God, precious, then Israel, and, God, and then Christians. We that believe in Jesus, we're called aside, and each of us is an individual that we are a priest. We are established a priesthood. We go directly to God. That's what the priests did. They went to God in behalf of the people, usually. We don't, we don't have any of those peoples. We don't believe that stuff. Tell you what, if I sin or I've got, you know, I do wrong and I need to be forgiven or restored, I don't run in and make an appointment with Tim and say, oh, woe is me. He says, just a minute here, I'll go sacrifice something for you and, and, and I'll be right back. Let me see what I can find. That doesn't work that way. I go to the Lord on my knees, I bow my head in the car. As I walk, I ask by myself, I say, Lord, this is a need in my life. Forgive me, cleanse me, make me better. Praise you for what you are. Amen. And uh, we need to praise God in our life. And that's what it's talking. And guess what it is? It's acceptable to God. Actually, the word by can be translated through in the Greek. Do any of you in your Bibles have the word through? Carol has through. Okay, it's through Jesus Christ. It's acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Every, did you ever know that everything runs through Jesus? Everything's got to go that route. They say all roads lead to heaven. I got news for you. All roads go through Jesus. Our li all our lives go through Christ. Amen. Verse 6. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the scripture. Okay, he says, okay, because of what we've just read, may I remind you of something in case you don't get it? That's what's being talked about here. Okay, here's a reminder, in case you didn't get it, we've already talked about this. Also, it is contained in the scripture. May I remind you that this is in the Old Testament. You grew up on this. Behold, I lay in Zion a cheap cornerstone, elect precious again. He that believes on him shall not be confounded. The word wherefore, because of what's written above, I just alluded to that. The word contained means included. So, because of what I've just shared with you, it is also included in the Old Testament scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believes, actually it should be reading this, he who is believing. Okay, it takes, the, here's what the difference is. If you said, I believe in Jesus, I accept that. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. If you walked up and say, well, I'm, I am believing in Jesus, that would make me think to start with, but you would be probably more correct because Sometimes we say, I believe in Jesus, and it's a fact. It's like I signed up for Social Security, and I don't need to sign up anymore. You follow the, the tie-in of the thought process there? And so it gets straightened out here very easily. The Greeks understood this. The Jews understood what was exactly being said. And the word believe here is talking about those that are they're Christians that we are believing today. I believe Jesus was my savior yesterday. Guess what I believe today? Same thing. And, I, and Lord willing, if I'm here tomorrow, I will say that same thing to you tomorrow as you would. I am believing in Jesus. So as I go, as I go along my way, it's an action verb. My faith, my trust, my belief is in Jesus just as I walk my life. He's right there. Then go on, it says, and, and he that believes on him shall not the word not is a double negative in the Greek. And it says no, not at all. And I could go on and just say no, never, 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 whatsoever, da, 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 da. It's saying there's just no possibility that, that who believes in him, there's just no possibility whatsoever than be, be confounded or put to shame. 
Is there something to be ashamed about that we're a Christian? Christians shouldn't have to run and hide or cower or just remain silent in a, in a room when there's garbage going on and, and stuff. God's people should stand up and speak up and walk this life and not be ashamed because we've got a great calling. Now, something for you here. I pulled the words and I correlated the words from the Hebrew Old Testament of this verse, which that's an Old Testament verse, and I put it with the Greek, and here's how a Jew would look at that today and how they would read that. Here's how a Jew in the Old Testament would read that. Let me read it with you out loud because this is how the verse goes. Look! What's, what's the, in, our, in our Bibles, what's it say there? Behold. Most of you have behold, don't you? Okay. It actually means, look! I've got something exciting to share with you. Do I have your attention? It got the Jews' attention. The word behold was a, hello, I have something to say. Something super to say to you. And it says this, look, I am laying in Zion. That's how the Jews, that's how Zion gets written out of the Hebrew in English. Have you ever seen it S-I-O-N? Yes, most of the time you see it how? Z-I-O-N. Okay, but the S, but the Z-Y is an S sound. It's Zion. Zion is how it gets pronounced. So you have the Z sound, but then you've got, of course, a T there that throws that on that. The, the, the Hebrew alphabet does not have as many letters as, as uh, the English one that we have, nor the Greek, a different number. And so it says, look, behold, look, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and whoever rests his trust on it will certainly not be humiliated. Nothing to be ashamed about. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. What's the rest of it? That he died for me. Died for me. Our rest and our trust in Christ is nothing to be ashamed about. <laughs> Glory, this is cool stuff. Okay. The bag is back, and, uh, no, and I am not ashamed of the virtual baker bag. Here it comes. This is not in your notes. This is brand new. And guess what? We're going to go through it, and you're going to go home. I just didn't tell you there's seven things, and they're 20 minutes each. I didn't say when you were going home. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best I can and wrap this up. And we're going to finish this point, and we'll just have to finish this section when we come back next week. But you, this is why you have that second little sheet just to take some notes on here, because this is all about our Redeemer, Redeemer Rock. It's about Jesus and how he, and talking about rocks and stones, I have pulled all of the, all of the, 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 the times that he is mentioned in the Bible and how he appears to individuals as a rock and, and what his function is. And so this is all about our Savior, the solid rock. Um, and I won't be singing the song, but it, it's about Jesus and rocks and stones in, in the scriptures. I'm going to go way back and we're going to start in, the, in actually sort of the chronological order. Back in Exodus 17, 6, here is this verse. Behold, I'll stand before you there upon the rock and horb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of people. Here is this, Jesus is the smitten rock. Any time that you see things going on in the Old Testament, I got news for you. They were either dress rehearsals or they were pictures of Jesus Christ and who he was going to be and how he was going to be to his people. Jesus, right off the bat, is, this was very prophetic, that Jesus would be the smitten rock. That he would do, be what? Moses hit the rock and got water out of it. And there was a people that beat Jesus and hung him on the cross. And the beating that he took and his blood that he shed. That would be the picture. But he was a smitten rock to all who are thirsty. Jesus is our water. 
That's the picture that one needs to be portrayed here because of his sacrifice. Jesus is the, the water of life. And I, I love the story of the woman at the well. You know it well. You know it well. You know it gooder? Good? You know it well, well. How's that? We'll just do it that way. I heard a sermon one time, and I wrote it down. I'm not going to give you all the points of it, but they were really cool. And the, the title of the sermon was Why the Woman Left Her Pots. Because the pitchers. Because she was out there getting water when no one else, she was a, a harlot, and she couldn't go when the other women went. And so she was getting water, and Jesus shows up and asks for water. And the discussion goes on, and she gets saved. And does she get saved? She goes running back into town. And so the message says, why did he leave? Why did she leave those pitchers of water? And he went down these points and everything. But the very last one was the coolest what I thought. She left the pitchers that were filled with water because she took the well with her. She didn't need those stupid pitchers because she had, she had the well, the source, the eternal source of it all. And folks, we got the eternal source. Amen. Praise God. Here's the second one. We've been reading this one. Jesus is a precious stone to all who have tasted it. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Really, remember I gave you the, the rendering of this verse last week. It really was talking about, and if you do these above things, you understand what it is to taste Jesus Christ, to know him. And, and it comes again in verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them those disobedient, it's a stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. It didn't matter that Israel rejected him. He's still the foundation of our faith. That's what's being talked to here. He's a precious stone to all who have trusted him. I got news for you. Jesus Christ is a rock that doesn't move. It is precious. He's more precious than gold and silver. Anything we got is incredible. Number three, he is the chief. We've been reading this. He's the chief cornerstone to the church. The foundation of the church is not Peter. Not anybody else. The foundation of the church, the chief cornerstone, the stone that goes in first, that all that supports, that can handle the weight and the function and everything of that building going up, the church, is Jesus Christ. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The apostles spread the word of God, were solid in the church, and it went up from there, from the first century church fathers to today. The church is... The church is still alive, and this church is still being built, and is still, being, is still growing. Jesus is the true and the chief cornerstone. Number four, he was a stumbling rock or a stumbling stone to the Jews at his first coming. It tells us right there. Jews didn't want him. But boy, he was truth, and when they came to him, they, they fell on their faces. <laughs> they fell in the mud. I was do, doing some, uh, I'll just tell you, I was doing some research and something. I was Laura Ingalls Wilder, and I saw on TV, and um, uh, the, who's the girl's name? Everybody hates. Um, Hillary. Hil no. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, who was it? The, the Olsen girl. Nellie. Nellie, okay. Everybody hates Nellie. My favorite episodes is when Laura got her down by the pond or the pigsty. There were no other episodes worth anything except when, when, that, when Laura could get her down there and fight with her. And sometimes Laura got dirty too. But it was the dirt, mud, dirt and mud on your back and on your legs and your arms. That ain't nothing. You want Nellie to come out of there with her face covered in that stuff. Now that's, now that's a good show, if you ask me, on Little House of the Prairie. They would do that. Now... Yeah, I know that. So, but see, I, I say, how did I get on that? Well, falling over a stumbling block or something. So Laura, see, Laura was Nellie's stumbling block. She really was in, in life and on that show, if you look at it that way. It really, that's, she was there. And Nellie was always stumbling over her. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but it was by works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They thought their works would get them to heaven. Obey the law. And Jesus said, it's not the law. The law is a picture of me. Believe in me. Believe in the Father. Get your hearts right. Come back. 
Come back, come back. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. That's Romans 9. Wow. Quoted Peter. Peter quoted him. They both quoted Old Testament. Number five. Jesus is the headstone at the corner to the Jews at his second coming. When Jesus comes back, how many Israelites get saved right off the bat? get called to the Lord. Do you know? Revelation, early chapters. 144,000 Jews sold out to the Lord immediately. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth a headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. The, the mountain really is talking about the function of the, 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 the immensity of Israel, the numbers of Israel, mountain of people. Israel. And the mountain was, is, could be great. And Zerubbabel was one of the builders back of the wall and reestablishing Israel and bringing Israel back again. Zechariah was nearby, but somewhere else, serving the Lord. And God, through that, brought out the headstone at the corner, but realized, hey, you've missed it. You're going to have to wait till the second coming as a prophecy for Jesus to return. I will. Okay. The good thing to do is just copy smiting stone cut without hands the Gentile world powers of his coming and then write Daniel and go home and look it up. But I think you probably already thought to do that. You can, you can look it up while you have your bowl of cereal tonight. You can do that. That would be good. We'll do that. Can I go on please? Stop there today. I think that's a dynamic enough and we'll pick up. I'll review just a tad but we'll finish this section real quick. Question?